So this morning, as we talk about the Jesus agenda, we're going to talk about the cry of brokenness. This is going to be part two. Uh, part one, you could almost say, was our attitude about self. Part two could be looked at as our attitude towards sin. Because he's really walking us in, and he's taking us to a new, another paradox today. And it's kind of like, it's not kind of like he is saying, blessed are the sad. Happy are the sad is where he's at today. So we have to remember that Jesus is building believers inside out. So the old paradigm was keepers of the law outside in. Now this new paradigm is I'm going to build you inside out. So he's laying out this agenda of who the Christian is and what it looks like to be a disciple and the work of discipleship in the life of the believer. And so he's going through this. So every wrong thought and belief has to be destroyed. This is the crucified life. He's not, this is not replacing bad with good. The issue of the Christian life is that we die to self. So it's a destruction. It's a, it's a doing away with of all the bad thoughts, all the wrong thoughts, everything that is counter to truth. It's not that it has to be replaced. Is those things have to die because those are the nature of self. And so he's dealing with this issue of what it looks like. Now, the word for mourn here in verse 4, where it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word mourn is a grieving word. It describes a deep and profound loss, like you would lose a loved one to death. Something very important. So in the context of the Beatitudes, it's grief and sorrow that is associated with the discovery of sin. Now, how do we know that? Because he, of what he's doing in verse 3. He's talking about these are spiritual issues here. He's working inside out. So it's the grief once in brokenness. He, we get rid of self. We are now in position to understand sin. There's no need in going to have this grief word here, mourning, until you break through self and get a right perspective. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it like this, Let a man once feel sin for half an hour, really feel its tortures, and I warrant you, he would prefer to dwell in a pit of snakes than to live with his sins. If you can look on sin without sorrow, then you have never looked on Christ. You see, it's in our broken state that we're positioned accurately to see without the delusion or the deception of self. Now, here's the deal. A Christless and crossless faith doesn't have to worry about sin. It doesn't matter. But if the gospel, and it literally means good news, if the gospel brings good news, that means there must be bad news. And the bad news is what he's dealing with. The first, that self, self has to be dethroned. And sin has to be dealt with in order for the good news to be good. You have to understand that there's a bad news situation. So brokenness allows me to see my sin in relation to Jesus. I'm not evaluating my sin by its effect on me. I'm evaluating my sin by its effect on my relationship with Jesus. Okay, It's not about what it does to me, but how it impacts my fellowship with Jesus. And so the depth of mourning... The depth of our mourning is going to be determined by the depth of our love. How deep do we love Jesus? And this is not, and let me go back to this. This is important. This is not about becoming absorbed with self. This is not about beating self up. This is not about trying to make yourself feel something. It's about realizing who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing. You're not try, he's not getting us to a place of self-pity. Can I tell you something? Self-pity still deals with self. Okay, I don't mourn, I don't mourn because I'm fixated on me, I mourn because I get fixated on Jesus, and I see him as he is, and when I see him as he is, I said this before, I see me as I am, so Jesus doesn't go through this thing of just get over it here, he's not saying, hey listen, everything's going to be alright, just get over it. 
And he doesn't say, hey, time's going to fix this. Time is a great healer. Time heals all things. He's not going in that direction. He's moving beyond these artificial words into something that's authentic and supernatural. Now, here's the issue, and this is where I'm at today. One of the hardest things to do today in our culture, it's very difficult, is one, to recognize sin, two, to repent of it. I don't know if you watched this week, but there were three presidents from Ivy League schools this week. Three of them. And they were all asked to denounce statements of genocide. I mean, Harvard, Yale, and Penn. These are supposed to be bastions of intellectual thought. Okay? So when these three presidents were asked to condemn speech that promoted genocide, anti-Semitic speech toward Jews, they could not denounce it. They would not denounce it. Let me say, they would not denounce it. They couldn't call it evil. They couldn't call it hate. They couldn't call it destructive. Couldn't, wouldn't, whatever, but they refused to do so. One of them has resigned. The, the president from Penn has resigned. Uh, she's regretful. I wonder was she regretful after the billion-dollar gift was removed. You know, the Yale president has said, now after further thinking upon it, she regrets her answer. How hard is this? When someone says, let's wipe out a whole race of people, how is that hard to condemn? What's hard about that? You say, Bucky, what's that got to do with sin? That's the culture we live in. We can't even call outward, really clear-cut case, i.e. genocide, we can't call it evil. We struggle to call what is obviously evil, evil. And we use intellectual speech of, we need to know the context. It's genocide. It's genocide. Okay? So that's the culture we live in that doesn't really want to hear about sin, doesn't really want to deal with sin, and really can't define sin. And so if you were looking for a biblical definition of sin, it's literally missing the mark. That good, perfect, reasonable will of God. It's missing the mark. It's characterized by deceit and lawlessness. That's the characterization of sin. And that lawless means behaving as though there is not a sovereign creator in which one has to answer to. So if sin is missing the mark, that's the negative. There's the positive. We hit a mark. Well, what mark do we hit? If sin is missing a mark, then we have to hit a mark. We just Because sin's never neutral. You understand this? Sin is not neutral. Y'all get that? <laughs> I, see, this is the wonderful thing. It's a rainy day. Okay? It's a busy season. And I'm preaching on sin. <laughs> I'm just saying. Glad y'all are here. So here's, here's the thing, so, but we've got to get this, because here's the, if we don't understand the bad news, we'll never celebrate in the good news, and that's what this text is all about here. And so as we put in this, and we get a hold of this, you see, God's mark must be hit. If it's not, that's sin. Now, Jesus is doing something here, and in the context we're going to get to it, he's preparing soil so that we would be fruitful. Because he's going to tell us later on in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, he's going to talk to us about fruit and how trees are known by their fruit. Good trees bear good fruit. Bad trees bear bad fruit. He's going to have this whole fruit conversation. So in these Beatitudes right here, he's really enriching the soil so that we can produce the good fruit that's talked about in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But now... He's also dealing with something that's happened. He's got to deal with a mess that's been going on in Jerusalem for a long time because he's, he's also going to deal with false prophets and false peace. And so I want you to understand something. This issue of not dealing with sin properly has been around for a long time. 
Cain and Abel, since the first sacrifice, okay, it, it's been around. How we deal with sin and understand sin, it's been around for a long time. The prophet Jeremiah made a great assessment of the people of God in Jeremiah 6, 13 and 15. In verse 13 he says, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Now look at where Jeremiah is going. He's saying the people in the pulpit are creating a mess. And here's the mess they're creating. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially. Saying peace, peace, but there is no peace. What is he saying? That these priests and prophets have been telling Israel, you're okay, you really don't have a sin problem. There's nothing wrong. We're not at war with God. God's not mad with us. Everything's okay. It's peace, peace. God's not mad. We just live in a tough time. Y'all understand where I'm at? But listen to what he says. Verse 15. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. You can't have shame if you don't have a proper understanding of sin. See, brokenness removes the veneer of this self-reliance and says, I'm empty, I have nothing, this is who I am. Now it moves to why, I'm, if I'm broken and empty, I'm doing empty stuff. And I, that creates this sin issue in my life that I've got to deal with. Therefore, they shall, fall among them, they shall fall among those who fall. And at the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. So in other words, he's saying, listen, here's what's going to happen. They don't recognize that their priests are telling them the wrong stuff, that everything's not okay, that time doesn't heal everything, that you need to pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just move on. He's calling them to repentance. And so we need to understand what repentance is because that's what he's calling us to. So brokenness reveals that we're sinners. Mourning is taking us to the point that we realize what we do as sinners. We sin. But we need to understand that repentance is not just merely a change of direction, but it's a change of mind and attitude, how we think about sin. Because that's what he's dealing with here. He's talking, there are Beatitudes because they're about how we think about how we live, who we are and how we live and what we do. That we think about it. That we're just not mindless robots just drifting through time waiting to die so that we can go to heaven. That's not what he's talking about. He wants us to be purposeful. He wants us to be engaged, not passive. It's not just thinking differently, it's thinking rightly. It's coming to your senses like the prodigal son in John chapter 15 where the prodigal son, he's in the pig pen. You remember the prodigal son? He's the guy that took his dad's money early, his inheritance. Okay? Remember prodigal son? He takes the inheritance. He goes living big, living large. He spends all his money on wine, women, and pleasure. You find him in a pig pen He's eating the pig slop that's left over from the pigs. And the verse actually says he comes to his senses and realizes that he could live better as a slave in his father's house than he is now. <coughs> so he starts thinking rightly. I mean, that makes sense. When he realizes slaves have it better than I do, I'm just going to go back to my father's house and ask him, can I be a slave? And so that's what he does. He's, he's thinking rightly. See, repentance is thinking rightly about self and sin so that you can get to right decisions. See, this idea that Christianity is this mindless jaunt, you can't find it in Scripture. It has everything to do with how we think. How we think about self, how we think about sin. And so it's coming to your senses. In brokenness, we change the way we think about self. In mourning, we change the way we think about sin. We're no longer thinking in the context of the world, but in the kingdom of heaven. That's a big deal. We're thinking in the context of heaven, not the world. Now, there's false repentance and there's true repentance. I know y'all been thinking about this the whole time I'm preaching. When's he going to get this thing about false repentance and true repentance? Okay, I'm here, okay? Calm down. 
So false repentance, we're going to see. There's a classic text on repentance in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, I now, verse 9 through 11, it says in verse 9, I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. What's Paul talking about here? There was an issue in the Corinthian church where there was adultery between a stepson and his father's wife, his stepmother. They were sleeping together. And the church wasn't dealing with it. And so Paul writes a letter, a scathing rebuke. That's not the only issue. The other issue is they weren't handling the Lord's Supper with any type of holiness. They weren't calling their members to righteousness and separateness. I mean, so he writes this scathing letter to them. Many believe that's the first letter to Corinthians. And they respond rightly. So now he's recognizing their right response to godly rebuke. And that's where he's at. He says, I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourself. What indignation. What fear. What longing. What zeal. What avenging of wrong. And everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. You see, false repentance, or as Jeremiah describes, superficial healing can be the result of being rightly broken but wrongly healed. In other words, it's a guilt trip. You feel guilty about it. See, Paul is describing a sorrow that goes beyond the harm of action, but sorrow that recognizes that the harm was done in fellowship with Jesus. It's not just saying, oh, I'm sorry I hurt you. It's recognizing what the harm caused. So false repentance doesn't produce change. Because he said, listen, the godly sorrow produced something. False repentance doesn't doesn't produce change. Why? Because it looks for justification excuses. Well, I did this because of this. So I I, I messed up, but I had a good reason to mess up. I I hear this a lot sometimes, and, and especially today. And I hear, well, I'm this way because, I mean... I grew up in this environment. My parents were this way, and so therefore I'm this way. And can I, I get that. But can I tell you, there's a place you have to let your parents off the hook and you become accountable. You, know, you don't get to hang on that hook your whole life. I'm sorry. There, in, in our marriage, there are things I didn't have a good example in marriage. So if I just tell her, well, I'm this way because this is the way my mom and daddy did it, uh 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 uh. There's going to be two kinds of pain. (laughs) You understand that? There's going to be the physical pain of being popped in the head. (laughs) Then there's going to be the emotional pain of what were you thinking? You see, so I'm just saying we create these excuses. Listen, I understand there's reasoning. There's reasoning when you get upset and, and, and you may have had a bad day. You may have had a bad day and somebody just caught you at the right moment and you snapped. You ain't got to raise your hand. All right? But then if you go to them and start this little apology thing, listen, I'm sorry. I just had a tough day. I'm just sorry that I snapped at you like that. All right? That recognizes your reasoning. It doesn't have anything to do with your resolve to repent. I mean, in that you say you don't recognize the hurt that you caused and you're, as a believer, listen, I'm a believer and my testimony matters a whole lot to me. And I realize that you know I'm a believer, and I don't want you thinking poorly of my faith and my Lord because of my action. And I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, one, that I offended the holy God, and I'm sorry, too, because I hurt you. And there's really no excuse that gives me liberty to act that way. I'm just saying... I understand reasons. I understand reasons that you can ca- listen. I'm telling you that I can. I, I can I just go somewhere for a minute. Good. 
Last week after Georgia lost, I didn't want to say anything because the wound was still a little fresh. But last week after Georgia lost, I'm telling you, the vitriol, I mean, that's expressed. It was a football game, people. You understand that? It's a football game. And there, I, I left out, I put a post on there. I meant to say there are no prophetic indicators about Georgia's loss to Alabama. I forgot the no. Oh, I got rebuked <laughs> for being sacrilege. And then there were people convinced that there were prophetic implications to the loss. <laughs> like, this is Armageddon. Things are going to end. And so when I corrected it and tried to be funny, then other people went, that's why you don't do that. that comes from, I mean, calm down. I, I'm telling you right now, y'all got to calm down. It's a game. We get all out of sorts out of things that don't matter. Can I tell you one of the things I'm learning as I get older? I'm going to tell it to you anyway. I don't know why I keep asking y'all, can I say this? One of the things I learned, I, I, I just learned the value of things that matter. I just, I, just, I just do. You learn the value of things that matter, and you realize if it doesn't matter, there's no need to get upset about it. You know? I mean, the, 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 I, mean I had people saying, man, how are you going to handle Sunday morning after that loss? What does that mean? It don't matter. It's a game, okay? I mean, it, it's kind of ridiculous. You realize we're paying somebody $700 million? The Dodgers are paying somebody $700 million because he can pitch and hit? And listen, at the plate, he's only going to be right 30% of the time. You want to fly on a plane where the pilot's only going to be right 30% of the time? He ain't making $700 million. She ain't making $700 million. You all right? I'm just saying, we're, we're paying $700 million. We're not. Los Angeles Dodgers, I mean, I understand it's California. They're accustomed to paying a lot for little. <laughs> but I'm just saying, sometimes we get our... When you get your priorities and your perspectives all out of whack, you don't see things for where they are. That's why you have to get into brokenness. In brokenness, I realize there's nothing good in me. And therefore, now I'm understanding that I'm a sinner. Well, if there's nothing good in me, there's no good sin to hold of. I can't get to a place where I can excuse my sin for whatever reason. You can talk about bad day, bad way. I had a cramp in my leg, whatever. That's a reason for it. But the reality of it is, I still made a decision, knowing that reason, to act in a way that was contradictory to how God would act. I mean, Jesus was in a stressful situation on the cross when he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. If anybody understands having a bad day and letting that bad day rule your behavior and belief, Jesus would be that dude. That's why we have to be fixated on Jesus. Because that's the answer to the bad decision regardless of the... Because I'm telling you, when you give sin an excuse, you never get right. Never. Never. My dad, <laughs> a friend of his, uh, cheated on his wife. And it, it caused a stir in our little town. And so my dad would call me up. He said, man, I, I, I don't know what people expect. Have you, seen, have you seen the woman he cheated with? And I said, I, I know her, Dad. What's the big deal? He said, he couldn't help himself. <laughs> I said, so, Dad, you're telling me that because... She was very attractive. He had no choice. That's it. <laughs> I said, Dad, can I tell you that if I ever sat down with a couple and I was trying to help them get over there and I said, well, he really didn't have a choice. 
Can I tell you the hell that would be unleashed in that room at that moment? Well, what are you saying? I'm saying he didn't have a reason. It don't matter. It doesn't matter. There's not a reason. It's not her fault. It's his fault. He had a problem way before he ever saw her. It was the issue of lust. And that's why he did what he did. It had nothing to do with her. It had everything to do with what was in his heart at that moment, at that time. And for you to give him an out is wrong. Now, I didn't say it in that tone to my dad, but I did say that to him. He said, well, that's probably why you're going to get fired if you preach that. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I, I mean, I know I have, I, I grew up in a real world with real people who think these ways. I, I talk to them all the time. I'm not making this up. If you, regardless, if it's infidelity, I, a lie, cheat, whenever you give yourself a justification, an out, an excuse, you're going to forfeit what's promised in recognizing sin, and that's comfort. Which is false repentance that produces regret, self-pity, victim. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. That dude was a victim of an attractive woman. I'm a victim of an age that depends on cell phones. I'm a victim of this. I'm a victim of that. It's not my fault. I'm just a victim. You made a choice. Now, those are things that work in the life of a believer. Unbelievers, they don't have a Holy Spirit conscience in them to even feel the misery of it. They, all they can know is the issue of being caught and maybe hurting someone else. They don't think in terms of their relationship with Christ. They don't have the misery of that relationship. And by the way, as a believer, if you're saved, you will never be able to sin consistently and live in happiness. You won't. It's an impossibility. So false repentance doesn't produce change. It looks for justification, wants relief. False repentance is the sorrow of self and self-pity. So what does true repentance look like? Another great question. Thank you. <laughs> Psalm 32, and I'm not going to read all of it. We're going to walk through some of it in, here in these moments. You see, false repentance is based on Self-deception. But true repentance is based on truth and deliverance. So I will never confess sin rightly until I understand me rightly. That's why brokenness matters. So when we try to cover up our sins, it becomes exhausting. It sucks energy out. Listen to what in Psalm 32, verse 3. David, King David, and most believe he's talking about his sin with Bathsheba. See, he, he, he dealt with this thing outside of Psalm 51. Most people think Psalm 51, that's where he really, he does deal with it, but he also deals with it here, but this is what he says. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. So he said, listen, because that's what David did. He tried to cover up his sin, and it drains your energy. It just, it just wears you out. If you're a believer and you're constantly trying to cover up, make excuses about sin, it wears you out. It drains you. It, it just does. I mean, you just, you just can't. And, and some people, I understand there's, there's more sensitivity than others, and, and, and stuff like depend. Sometimes it's a personality, how you deal with that kind of stuff. Our, our two kids... Or, or, or they, they operate differently for each other in this stuff. Hannah is a big time rule follower. She's working in children's ministry today, so she's a rule follower. So she she likes rules and likes to do the rules. I mean, you, I aggravate her when I go around a rope that's designed to keep people in a line, and I just go around the rope. <laughs> Dad, there's a rope there. I know. Don't go around that. People are going to look at you. She's a rule follower. 
she's hypersensitive to things outside the rule. Ivy is more like his mother. He doesn't keep up with any rules. <laughs> That's me. So, I mean, his, his sensitivity to breaking rules is not nearly as high as Hannah's. Y'all understand that? So sometimes it, 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 there, there's a personality trait, but, but that doesn't give you an out. It just means you take more conviction. All right? Sometimes God has to hit harder. Y'all with me? Because you respond slower. There are some of you, you can't sleep unless you're right with people in your household. There are some of you, you'll get a night's sleep, but then it'll start wearing on you a little bit. And then you'll go deal with it, okay? But you'll deal with it, or you'll just be miserable, and here's the thing about it. You'll make everybody else miserable. Because if you can't be happy, nobody else can be happy. And that's just not about mama. That's about men, too. Man, I'm just telling you, when we start pouting, we, we put every woman in the room to shame. I'm just telling you, we do. Ain't nobody pouting like a man pout. Come on. <laughs> My men are, y'all are just letting me hang here. Just, well, here's what some of you are saying. You got there. On your own. Get out. But I'm just saying, but the, how we deal with it. So here's what, here's what David says. When I didn't deal with my sin rightly, it exhausted me. It took my energy away. My focus, everything about it. When I don't deal with sin rightly, that's what it does. I don't, I don't have the energy to, to deal with it. But now look what happens when I deal with it according to what it tells me in 2 Corinthians 7. It says, verse 11, For behold, what earnestness this thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourselves, what, indicate, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, and everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Verse 10 uses a thing without regret, which is no pain of mind. See, sin influences how we think. It gets into our mindset. And so when we repent rightly, we restore this refreshing, this energy. Verse 11 is describing the work of repentance in releasing and revitalizing mind and body from the guilt of sin. Instead of trying to figure out ways to cover the sin up, we get free from it. And we don't live in the regret of it because we're dealing rightly with it. Acts 3.19 3, says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing Come from the presence of the Lord. That word refreshing means the restoration of energy and freshness. But now listen to this. David cautions in Psalm 32 about being stubborn in this matter. Verse 9 of Psalm 32 says, Do not be as the horse or as the mule. Don't look at other people when I talk about horses and mules. Which have no understanding whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Here's what David's saying. You can't make somebody do what they don't want to do. God wants you to willingly confess in order to get completely right. There are people that come to me and say, hey, listen, so-and-so's got this problem. If I could just get them to talk to you. I said, do they want to talk to me? Well, no, but I can make them. Don't, I don't want to talk to them. I've learned countless times this lesson. You can't make somebody right who doesn't want to get right. I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I can't. If you don't want to get right, if you don't want to deal with your sin, there's nothing I can do to make you deal with it. I can't guilt you into it. I can't cry you into it. I can't beat you into it. You can't. If you don't want to get right, I'm just telling you, number one, you have to want to. If you don't want to, it ain't going to work. And that's what David said. Be, he said, be careful. Do not be as a horse in the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include a bit and bridle to hold them. In other words, there's nobody that's going to yank a knot in you 
I mean, I can be frank with you. I can be up front with you. I can be clear with you. But if you don't want to be right, there's nothing I can do to make you right. It's just not there. I've had people hear my testimony and say, listen, I've, I, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a child. Uh, they're they're kind of like you. They've been rebellious. They've been kind of, they can just sit down with you. And I said, do they want to sit down with me? No. Don't send them. When they want to, I'll be glad to talk to them. Be more than glad to talk to them. But if they don't want to, they'll endure it to get you off their back or to make me think a certain way about it, but they're not going to do anything. If they don't want to, it doesn't work. I'm just saying just how true that is. You can't make people get right who don't want to be right. Now, as a parent, there's another dynamic to that. Okay? I mean... You can, you can create behaviors out of restrictions and pain to a specific part of the anatomy where they sit. You can heat that up. <laughs> I'm going to move on. I'm, but I'm talking about as a believer. I mean... Mm. So this morning cannot be forced on us. You see, I don't know who says this, but there's a great quote that says, change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. When the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, they change. They come to their senses. So he says, this issue of comfort here, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall find comfort. This is not just eternal comfort, but heaven's comfort. It's the same word we talk about the Holy Spirit. Perikaleo, it's a classic Greek. It refers to a legal advisor, a pleader, or an advocate. This is also the same word to describe helper. And so when we rightfully mourn, and we rightfully assess, because we're empty of self, and we understand sin, and we rightfully assess this, the blessing of the comforter comes after the obedience of mourning. So rightly mourning releases my advocate to do the work of comfort. And 1 John 2, 1 says, my little children, he's talking to believers, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I, I, I cannot say this enough. Jesus doesn't bring up our sin to, build, to beat us down, but to set us free. He wants us to come clean so that he can bring comfort. And when we cover up our sin, we withhold comfort. When we make excuses for our sin, we keep the work of comfort from happening. It, it, we don't get comfort. The mercy's not there. When we don't deal rightly with sin, it's just not there. So if I want comfort in my life, I've got to deal rightly with sin. If I want the mercy, and there's a point where the, this idea, this grief, it's not necessarily outward crying out. This is this inward recognition. Sometimes it gets you to a place of crying out. It does. Can I tell you as a parent, as a husband, there have been times when I've gotten it so wrong when I've blown it and I get so frustrated and then I deal with it that my attitude was wrong, my tone was wrong, my timing was wrong, my thinking was wrong and the reason I acted toward her or toward them and the way that I acted to was because there was a sin, sin problem in my life and then once I got the sin, there are times I just cried out to God and said, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. I've allowed this to take root in my life and it's causing all this stuff. And I can't get right with them until I'm right with you. There are times you have to cry out like that. There are times if you come into my prayer room, you think I'm a lunatic. Because there is some crying out. There's some crying out. Because you realize it just keeps getting worse and worse and it's just sucking you dry. And you try to do some things, you know, you try to be cheerful and happy and 
That ain't working. There are times you just got to cry out. God, I got to deal with this. This is on me. I realize I made the decision to do what I do. I made the decision to think like I think. I did it, Lord. Nobody else did it, and I did it knowing what you believe about it, knowing what your word says about it, and I still did it. And it never works out good. And if you don't recognize that, then you're, you're like that horse and that mule that David talked about. You lack sense. But here's what he says, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate. Who's that advocate? Our paraclete, the Holy Spirit. He goes to plead our case on our behalf. You see, here's what we allow to rob us of comfort, compromise when we compromise on the issue and think it's not a big deal, we lessen it. Culture, which is nothing, relative moralism. Well, it's okay with our culture. Why is it such a big deal in church? Or why are you dealing with it? The culture doesn't say it's wrong, why are you dealing with it? Or comparison. And this may be the most vicious thing, when we compare ourselves to other people. And here's the thing, I, you better understand this, the person you, that says they're a believer and living like they're, you might want to check, you're not the Holy Spirit, they may not even be a believer. They just go to church. So maybe they're not bothered by that sin because they don't have the conscience to be bothered by it. I mean, I'm just saying, you better be careful when you're comparing yourself to somebody else because you may not, you, you're not the Holy Spirit, you don't know who they are and what's going in their mind. That's why you get fixated on Jesus because he's the author and finisher of our faith. So you better know who Jesus is and what Jesus thinks about it instead of looking at somebody else because somebody else can mess you up, can put you on a train wreck. So you better understand that. So what are some results to getting comfort? I had to quit writing these down. Because there's just so many results. Well, there's freedom from the comparison trap. I'm not, not, I'm not comparing myself because I, I'm free in Christ. So I'm going to live according to Christ. So I'm, I'm not comparing myself with anybody else. I'm not easily offended. Oh, can I tell you what freedom there is in not being easily offended? In the last three weeks, I've had five people come up to me and apologize for saying something that offended me, and I didn't even know it. I know I said something to that family. I said, when, when did you say that? You, you weren't, I said, no. See, if you walk around with your stinger out, waiting to be offended, that's a Dover term. You walk around just waiting to be offended or waiting to get mad at somebody that's offended you. But see, when you're, when you're freed up from sin, when you're freed up from sin, you're not easily offended. You're, you're not aloof or naive. You're just focused on Jesus. And he wasn't easily offended. Mm. Some of y'all, that, that'll help some of y'all right there. And it, when, you're, when you're not easily offended, you know what you become? Less defensive. You're not having to defend yourself so much because you're not easily offended. You're free to forgive. You're free to forgive. We're going to talk about this in a little bit later. Why? Because you recognize as a sinner how much you've been forgiven from. When you understand what you've been forgiven of, you ain't holding back on nothing else. Terrible grammar, great preaching. <laughs> you have a gracious attitude. Kindness. I mean, you show grace and kindness to others. I mean, you're just gracious. You don't walk around mad. You ever seen somebody walk around mad? Don't point right now. <laughs> I mean, you ever seen, watch people walk around mad all the time? They're just mad. They're just angry. I'm not talking about people with a solemn. There are people that are solemn that just, they just don't smile very much. They're happy. They tell me, I know I have friends like this. They're solemn people. They tell me they're happy. They, their face has just not been notified of their internal condition. <laughs> I mean, there are the folks who are just solemn, straight-faced. Like, I mean, you'd hate to play poker with. You know what I'm talking about? Not that you should play poker. But I'm saying, <laughs> spades. You play spades with them. I'm just saying, but, but, I'm just saying, but you just, the, there are people that you just, that have this, 
demeanor about them that speaks of graciousness and their, their gracious attitude that they just encourage you and, and you see them and they think, man, you just always are happy. You're just always happy. I get any most of them because they keep short accounts on the sin side. They don't walk around trying to figure out how to hide their stuff. And they can genuinely be happy. I'm not talking about somebody who just smiles like the joker. <laughs> Some of y'all have no idea what I just said. It's okay. I'm talking about somebody who's genuinely, authentically happy. Much less critical. Oh, God, y'all know somebody that could, if I said like, like could you stand up and lead us in a word of criticism? I mean, I've been doing this 40 years. I mean, I, this is what I tell young guys that are going to ministry. If you let criticism bother you, do something else. Because you're never going to get it right. You're, you're just not, I mean, there's some people you're just never going to get right in the ministry. And, this, and the other thing that aggravates me is how they complain about it. When they start complaining about how people don't appreciate it, I said, D- have you ever seen Jesus? Do you understand The people he came to save were the very ones that killed him. Do you get that? And you're upset because they didn't do what? It used to bother me when I traveled. I I, I traveled, and the pastor would get up there, and he would take, it would be time for a love offering. Now, for some of you that don't understand love offering, let me help you. Love offering was an extra offering that they take up as above their giving, and to support a ministry or something like that. I don't, I don't know that we've ever done a love offering here. We might need to do one just to show you. <laughs> For a ministry or something. Some of you are familiar with it. But they'd get up there, and every once in a while, this preacher would get up there, and this is how he would ask for the offering. And I, I, Lee, who works for BBK, and I tell Stacey, this it aggravates the hound out of me. Y'all, y'all better give. If you don't, I mean, he's got a family to feed. Now, this is back when I was still heavy. I mean, you could look at me and tell that I had not missed any meals. And it was not based on any financial gift that they had come through with. You know, he's got, a, he's got stuff out there. These guys, they are out there. I mean, God's called them. It's, 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 it's just, I mean, it sounds like God has condemned him to this service. We must help him. And I told one preacher, I said, man, I wish you'd let, let me do the offering because, I mean, all they got to do is I, I drive a nice truck. I wear nice clothes. I look healthy. My family is fine. Whether you give me a dime or not will not impact how we live. So please let me ask for the offering. And I will tell them that. That they should give out of a gracious spirit, not a guilty conscience. You know what he did? He thanked me. He called me six months later because he started doing it. He said, you know, our people have really responded in giving. <laughs> I reckon so because I imagine you if y'all don't give, Lord knows the doors are coming off. We've got to sell some stuff. Life's going to happen. We make Jesus sound like a beggar. And so I'm just saying with a gracious spirit and without a critical attitude, I mean, I'm just saying, Get used to people aren't not everybody's going to agree with you. You don't have to have an opinion about everything, and not everything is going to be done in a way that suits you. Sometimes we'll sing songs you don't like, sometimes we'll have programs you don't like, sometimes something will happen you don't like. I understand there are times we do stuff I don't like. I'm just saying that. that, that just, that, I mean, y'all understand we all got times and issues and motives that we don't have to have an opinion about everything. Lord, we ought to have babies and Bibles being thrown right there. <laughs> Celebration should have taken place. I don't like how they change diapers in the nursery. Well, they don't like how often your child goes. How about that? <laughs> you like that? You good with that? Just be grateful. When you deal with sin, you, get, you live grateful because you realize what God's done for you. And forgiving a sin that he was under no obligations. We forget this. He was under no obligation to do. He forgave what he was not obligated to forgive. 
We live in this idea where Jesus has to forgive me. No, we live in the promise that he wants to. He wants to. But if you never mourn your sin, you can never be comforted for it. And mourning means I recognize that this is an offense toward God. I realize that he is faithful and just and righteous to forgive that which I confess and repent of. And will bring refreshing energy and enthusiasm to my life from within. So that I will not be haunted by the pain of regret. Bucky, there are things I, I've, I've confessed and got clean of. And, and, and what do you do when those get popped up in your mind again? I bring every thought captive to Christ. Because I realize if I confessed and I repented... He's not putting it there. That's the enemy. And I bring, I said, Lord, you've already forgiven me of that. It's under the blood. It's clear. And can I tell you how clean my mind gets right there? Now, if I choose to dwell on it, that's on me. But if I choose to surrender it to Jesus, that's on him. When I give him what he's already taken care of, he puts it where he said he would in the sea of forgetfulness. And he puts a no fishing sign on it. So the only person that's going to bring it up is the enemy. All right? And the enemy's got friends. There'll be people that he'll send along. That'll tell you. They'll remember it when Jesus has forgotten it. That's that's, that's a whole other sermon. (laughs) Y'all do know that. Jesus forgets everything. Some people ain't forgetting nothing. Amen? I'm just telling you. If you... (laughs) I got to do this because it's good. If you're in a service industry and you, something happened that was beyond your ability to control and you tried to do everything you can, but for some reason that customer was never going to be satisfied and they just walk around and ever since that time they've told everybody how bad you are because you, you didn't meet a need for them. You all right? I'm just saying, you ever done that? Yeah. Especially you, like you know that, don't you? I mean, no, how many tires you put on right, and then somebody got upset about something, and they come back later, and they just the, the, y'all are just a bad tire company now because you know it happens, not very often. That's why I'm not saying who you are. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you something. I don't stop going to McDonald's because I got a cold box of fries one time. Y'all, y'all, y'all feel me? Yeah. Now, some of y'all are going, you should never go to McDonald's. That's trashy food. You'll die eating that. It's got chemicals in it. You'll shrivel up and you'll never see your children. <laughs> so where are we at here? How are you going to deal with sin? How sensitive are you to it? I mean, Really? People ask me, well, Buggy, how, how big do I let sin get to the point of consciousness? The moment I think about it, the only reason I'm going to think about it is because the Holy Spirit put it there. And if the Holy Spirit put it there, he's expecting me to do something with it. Recognize it, repent, and move. And grieve that I let it happen. Now, sometimes there there, it doesn't mean that I'm just a basket case all the time. There are times I just recognize it and I have to move on. Okay? And, but I, mean, I, I recognize it to the point that it, 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 it's bothersome. But if, if it's in my mind, I've got to deal with it before I move on. If I don't deal with it, there is no moving on. There's just being stuck. And here's the, a little sin can build a, a very big stronghold. It can so i got to deal with it. And sometimes the morning, is, like I said, it's me crying out, verbally crying out. A lot of times it's just me recognizing it, driving down the road, and there's a thought pops in there, and I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. If that thought doesn't belong there, it's not of you. Please forgive me. I've sinned. I'm, I, and, I, and I have these conversations in my head all the time and in my heart. I mean... This is an attitude. 
It's talking about the way we think. And if I don't think right, I'll never do right. This is how it works. So how do you handle this invitation? One, you can't be conscious of how deep your sin is if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've never been saved, you can be conscious of how you've hurt people, but you'll never be conscious of how you've hurt him. And he can be grieved. The Bible tells us that God gets grieved. The Holy Spirit is grieved by our sin. That means he's hurt, he's wounded, he's grieved. And he's our God. A grieved God doesn't take us anywhere, okay? But if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you don't have a conscience to think that way. You don't even know where you are. You haven't even thought about it. All you can do is think in relationship to how it's hurt others and that you got caught. That's it. There's nothing else produced of it. But if you're a believer and you constantly let sin dwell and you let sin rule and reign and you do nothing about it, it's just, you're eventually going to be miserable. You're not going to be happy. You're not, how do you know that, Bucky? Because you said that. Bless are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. The happy people are those who mourn sin so that they can get comforted in it so they get happy. That's how I know that. Could it be in your marriage right now? Oh, I got to stop. I've got to stop. I've got to stop. Because it's just it. Could it be in your marriage right now that there's no happiness in your marriage because there's no confession of sin in it? And y'all just let stuff fester and blister. And could it be in your family that there's no happiness with you and your children right now because you won't deal with it? Hey, Dad, and I'm going to start with you. Dad, you're the leader of the family. If there's hurt relationship going on in your home right now, it's on you to fix it. Amen. Be a man. Go to your children and say, hey, listen, I've, I'm sorry. I did this wrong. I, I, I blew it. I've had to do that with my kids. And say, listen, I, I made a terrible decision in how I treated you. I spoke wrongly to you. I I did this. I'm sorry for how I treated your mother. You saw me treat your mother poorly. I'm sorry. Forgive me for that. And I've already asked her. We're good. I've had family meetings where I've brought them all together and said, Listen, I have been, I have been without prayer in my life. Forgive me. I've been a prayerless father. I've led you poorly. Forgive me. Now, why would I do that? Because the Holy Spirit wouldn't leave me alone until I did. But see, we, we, we want all these things to be produced, but in order to be produced, the soil has to be taken care of. And the soil is taken care of when you put the plow to it, when there's pruning, when there's care. And pruning's not always painless. It's painful. But if you're sitting here today wanting people to believe that there's no sin in your life, good luck. Good luck. Before I came in here today, I was in my office dealing with sin in my life, making sure that God, this is, I mean, I'm just telling you, and I'm pretty sure that there have been some sinful thoughts in the message today because some of y'all ain't responded yet. <laughs> messing with you not really I'm just saying why do I deal with this so much because I want you to experience the blessedness of comfort we live in a culture of aggression and stress you want comfort get clean you want to get clean trust Jesus You can do it at this altar today. You can do it when you get home. Just do it. Are you tired of being uncomfortable? Why not get comfort? That grudge you've been holding, that bitterness you've been stirring up, why let it have another minute of your life? 
Why? Quit making excuses. Quit justifying it. Quit being the victim. Get clean. For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.